summary of their initiative? You were the last one. Okay, so it's number three. <laughs> number three. <laughs> Let's start with number two first. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, good morning. It seemed a very good idea yesterday, <laughs> but after sleeping a night on it. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, we're still thinking about uh, making the Water Freud uh, project for real. But uh, nevertheless, we uh, for this collaboration workshop, we came up with another project, and that involves, of course, cinemas from different countries. The name is still a bit wobbly. Um, it was something like, first we take Ravenna, and then we take Maastricht, a cinematic takeover. Um, but the essence of this project is for, let's say, uh, for two days, we'll hand over our cinema to another European cinema. For instance, when Wouter from um, Maastricht would decide to collaborate uh, with Cinema in Centro from Franco, where are you? Uh, Franco from uh, Ravenna. Um, he would, uh, uh, Fran Franco and his colleagues would curate a two days program for Lumiere, Maastricht. Uh, although we like to pretend that this is a complete carte blanche situation, um, Wouter and his lot will have to provide the visiting team, the visiting cinema, with some essential information uh, on who Lumiere is, uh, what Maastricht is like, and what the usual modus operandi is. Uh, cinema and Censero, the visiting cinema, will choose its target audience based on local research. Um, in this research, Lumiere, sta Lumiere stakeholders are involved. They'll get to share their preference on certain topics. Would you like to know more about uh, Italian in politics? Oh yes, that's a very nice uh, picture from... Uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, would you like to know more about Italian film history? Might, be in, might they be interested in politics or underground culture, dating habits, food, music, or even why Italians don't drink cappuccino after 11? It's some kind of obsession for me. <laughs> Sorry. The purpose of this program is a cross-cultural excha exchange, of course. Instead of Dutch people organizing an Italian fil film festival, we have them, Italians, over to uh, do so themselves. They'll be meeting um, our audiences, and our audiences will meet them. We're all part of Europe. We share common grounds, but we might also cherish our differences. This whole pro project will not be done in a few weeks, of course. We think preparation, researching, uh, project development, funding, production, and uh, absolutely brilliant marketing campaign uh, will, might take a, uh, around nine months. It's like getting pregnant and then giving birth. Effective project management is, uh, is key, of course. Each cinema will, respons will be responsible for a uh, specific part of the project, but the receiving uh, cinema will carry overall responsibility. A rather sad part of this project is that we have to visit each other. Uh, getting to know each other, doing research, it's so extremely important. As you might understand, this project will be a huge and hopefully very exciting challenge in itself. There's only challenges we see here. The first takeover will be a pilot and then suc uh, when successful it can be developed into a European concept. Although we wouldn't mind expanding to other parts of the planet. Thank you. I really like the sort of cultural exchange side of it. It's very, you know, good in terms of cultural diversity and the Commission's kind of commitments to that. One of the things I think is worth thinking about is if you've got one team, a small team, having to deliver something in another country and another event, is someone from your cinema going to go and, and run their cinema during the festival? 
No, it's just thinking about capacities really and um and how much you can do remotely as well, um, in terms of like sustainability and so on. Um, so it's just thinking that through. And then thinking about whether there's another layer to the exchange um, between the practitioners. So yes, there is something for the audience, but maybe there's something about the cinemas actually just learning from each other as well, built in, just to add a, another layer. But that's great, thank you. And we're gonna go to number one. Okay, uh, let's try to go back to the idea of yesterday. Uh, the concept was based about something, uh, can you hear me, everybody? Thank you. Uh, I have in my cinema and on other cinema I know is uh, local uh, amateur productions, like shorts have been made with, uh, I don't know the word in English, like when you have uh, groups of people that help young, young people to make create some movies or amateur movies. The idea starts with something I, I discovered in, no, in Nova Cinema in Brussels called the Open Screens, where a space when people can bring the movie and show them to the audience. And like I said, also in my area with the suburb of Paris, there is a lot of people working on this project, helping people to create outside I would say it's a professional cinema. So the idea was why not exchanging that with other cinemas and other places in Europe or maybe other places in the world and try to create some kind of being highlands where people can drop movies they create as local, as non-professional and share them in between us. So basically, most of the times the local movies are shown in the local theaters and doesn't go to a few exceptions further than that. Some are selected in festival, but my Id la, the idea was to bring um, like a network of cinemas that shares and create open screen space for local creation and also permit the movies that people create in one place to be shown in other place and also discover movies from other people in other places in their place. So create some kind of emulation based on observing the works of each others on all of the places um, works and so p I create a dialogue between place creations from different countries. I think it's a scalable project because you can start with a few cinemas who do have already uh, uh, this kind of practice, this kind of surrounding by people that do this kind of work and start to exchange and create through a platform. Uh, first, uh, an access to this movie. Second, uh, an ex example of creation. And then let the other people in the other place pick up what they want to create, uh, I would say, a mashup between the movies they have on their own and the movies they can be taken from other places. Uh, there is major challenge, of course. First, uh, I would say it's subtitles. A very basic problem is how to uh, fix the question of if you bring a content from another place, depending of uh, what has been done, there will be or not a base for subtitles. So there is this problem that is cost effective in terms of time, and especially time effective at least to produce. So there is a bit of a need of centralization and maybe some rules to put in place that could be a problem. Of course, of is a problem also is the audience, bringing people to observe movies that have been made by local amateurs to other places with local amateurs need a bit of a communication and I think the incentive is to share, the incentive is to, but he has to be also uh, be built with a network of people who already do this work, we, we want to share that and try to create this kind of emulation. Um, I think it's all, sorry because I didn't have the notes so I try my best to resume the idea and voila. <laughs> I think I think it's a really really good concept. You're tapping into like an existing community. Um, I think the key would be to find groups, those kind of local open screen groups that are already super active, and that they buy into your concept of like an international element because you know it's the kind of a local global connection. And if they buy into it, then you might get an audience. If but you might end up having quite a small audience, which is just that network, rather than expanding a larger audience. But the one good thing, I think, with your concept is that the rights thing is not such an issue. 
because they'll be willing for their films to probably go somewhere else. And the subtitles is probably not that big a deal because you're not dealing with a studio film or something where you have to get highly professional. You could do DIY amateur subtitles, um, Google Translate or something. <laughs> if, it, if they're amateur films, maybe it's not such a big, a big barrier. Did you want to add anything? No? OK, cool. Um, and hopefully we can go back to number three. I've not forgotten about you. Whoever's in the room can rap. Yeah, yeah, we have a movement. And what a beautiful shirt you're wearing today. Thank you, it's the only beautiful thing about the day so far. <laughs> First thing, I was dreaming in the morning that I was fired and I wasn't set any reason whatsoever. And I come here and I hear a brilliant idea being be being be is being partially represented by like previous team. <laughs> so, okay, so try to mentally go back to, I think it was team number two, but imagine it on steroids. We are not talking about two days, we are talking about a whole week. Uh, we got a title for it. It's called uh, Freaky Week, like Freaky Friday, but not just just not Friday, whole week. And basically, it's based on it that you will basically take over another cinema for a week with all your stuff and crew. So not only programmers, but also like ushers, billeters. In case you got cafe, you also provide, and you got cafe, you always also provide your own uh, like a uh, team for the uh, like cinema bar, and uh, this will be also represented like graphically. So, for example, in case you got some uh, marquee on the cinema, it will be like redone or like rebranded to another cinema, your website, your socials. So another cinema from another country is basically for a week taking over your cinema and bringing their, you know, their program, their team, and basically thereness with everything. So, uh, and the team, which is like a hosting, the, which is like, a, like the normal host of the cinema, has to like hands off, you know, let's do them the rest stuff. In case uh, they will really fuck up, there will be a revenge, of course, because we will go be going there. Yes, uh, it's a very silly idea, but it was very fun, and we actually um, uh, we were still sober actually when we came up with this idea. And uh, yes, uh, a lot of uh, things were already presented, like uh, challenges and benefits in the previous uh, 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 introduction of like this uh, idea made more reasonable but in this case it's uh i would also say there is a lot of uh, like performative art actually it's almost kind of like uh, a very perform performatic like uh, art of a week basically like posing as another cinema and uh also I wouldn't like uh yes i would also stress the power of like uh, getting your team together because you can take take them all, like I'm really thinking like, it also depends like to pick up a similar cinema. So when some cinema is run by four people, get a cinema which is also run people. So you can like reciprocate in case it's a big cinema with its own bar stuff, you need also more. So pick up like a c cinema with similar vibe, but also like with similar kind of like uh, maintenance. But so you take your team there and you're really like having this kind of like workshop how to do everything elsewhere because I'm talking also projectionist, everything including technical stuff. Yes, so it's, you know, like of course there be something like preparation ahead, this is works in this way, this way, this way, this is our ticket system, this is how like projection works, but you take all the stuff and crew and put them in the cinema, okay, run it. So it will be really kind of like uh, this, uh, um, almost like like in the military sense almost almost like like some field exercise you know in case your cinema is fuck up you need to be somewhere else you know you can do everything you can deal with it also you can pick uh, uh, there, are, there are like participants from la paloma or like thessaloniki you can take them for a week to somewhere sunny somewhere nice you know 
and also it can be used very much like kind of like also a um, moral boost for your team and I think everybody can enjoy it and uh, probably more <laughs> than you <laughs> but we very much enjoyed it and we would very much love to do so because basically you've got like like a week of vacation which you don't have to take from your vacation you know also and um, is there something I forgot Uh, like s there is alwa always somebody to take over. I mean, I mean, we can close it there. I don't know. We can like plan some reconstruction, you know. <laughs> okay, there are some some loopholes still there somewhere. Like, the, don't don't think too deep about it. We will we will we will figure it out. <laughs> we really wanna go to La Paloma. <laughs> There is definitely something in it, that idea of someone might come and run it differently and solve some of your problems. Or, but I think you have to think about the exchange element, so maybe you need to go and run their cinema or something. Um, and it, it, it's, it's quite complex. I mean, I can't imagine our projectionists being very happy about someone coming in, however good they are. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to work through, but I think you've got something, and I like how brave it is. It's it's bold. It's brave. Um, so yeah. But I think this project also needs you to come in and explain to the staff that they're going on holiday, <laughs> but they also have to work really hard during the holiday. <laughs> <laughs> Learn a new box office system. <laughs> Learn a new projection system. A new language. <laughs> I mean, this is also good for local community. Basi basically, like imagine you're like uh, running a cinema in Iceland, and suddenly there's a whole Czech crew who are like kind of able to speak English, but like nobody speaks in Icelandic in the world. Also, like the the local community has to like you know handle this. It's like very like I would say performative thing or like thing about like yes, you have to explain your project and it's okay. Somebody else will be in your room for a week, just face it, try to be more like uh, respectful about that and then again you are invited somewhere else. It's got like a lot of a lot of like weird uh, uh, like levels which are really going uh, uh, somewhere like behind programming. Also the programming is also a definitely interesting element. Take something local, take something actually what really works in your cinema in case you are doing something special, do it there for example as a kino art. If I would go somewhere for we would run a movie quiz or something. You know, but it's just uh, the main point is actually really like go on this like uh, this crazy all the way. thing. Yes, all the way, all the way. There's no return. Thank you. <laughs> so we are actually going to go straight into the little set of presentations because it's a very tight schedule and we want to just allow a little bit of breathing space between each presentation. Um, so um, we're going to actually start, well, the, first of all, just to say we're actually focusing on spaces today, which is great because a lot of you have talked about your spaces and um, talked about some of the challenges. We're talking about spaces, but also in the context of sustainability and inclusion. And by sustainability, we do mean, you know, green sustainability, but also the sustainability of your work. Um, so it should be quite an interesting morning um, where we start sort of thinking about those spaces. Um, and there'll be some workshops elements later, which you can obviously bring back to your own, own venue. Um, so we've actually got one, two, three, four, five presentations. So it's a little bit of a marathon, um, but there's a reason for it. We have some um, extra kind of observer guests that are here. Um, we've got uh, Yang Yang from Hong Kong, who's going to introduce themselves as well. And we've got Steph Reed from Watershed in the UK. So we've got a little bit of outside of Europe perspectives as well uh, being brought into the space. Um, so we're going to start with Bob. Uh, so let's go to the Netherlands. Well, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Bob. You know me. Um, I'm going to switch the other microphone, by the way. Oh. Can we 
do this so I can see my notes? Nicolas? No, I don't think so. Or maybe there are no notes in this slide. Let's see. I'll figure it out. All right. Yeah, there we go. Uh, hi everyone. Um, I am. I've com this morning. I created a completely new presentation. Uh, I wanted to do something else, but going into this lab and seeing what we've discussed up until now, I thought I could do a little intervention uh, before we start talking about spaces. I'm going to talk about one of the spaces we've renovated recently and some learnings we made in that process based on uh, financing and greening and a little bit of accessibility if I get down to it, but I'm going to keep it short, short, short because there's so much more information that's coming your way. Um, so we operate three cinemas. Uh, one of them is called The Movies. It's a 110 year old cinema. It's beautiful. It has, uh, it's had many lives, but it's one of the most important things of this space is that it has uh, a faux art deco feeling. Um, I we have this, some pictures here just to give you an idea of what it used to look like. These are pictures from the 50s and the 70s. Uh, this space has had many different lives, but it's been in continuous operation for more than 110 years now. We're super proud of it. Uh, the customers really love it. Uh, it's had uh, a, a fan following. It's been very successful actually up until we opened another cinema in the in Amsterdam and then attendance really started to drop. So I don't know, that wasn't maybe that smart of us, but we're not tell you about what happened. So this cinema uh, was really old and unfortunately it uh, was also starting to fail. Attendance was lagging, the building was literally breaking down. Uh, Rats were crawling around, mice, lice. Uh, it was just, it was, it was, it was done. It was old. We had to do something, and then COVID came, of course. So we went into a few lockdowns. Uh, after the last lockdown, we didn't reopen. Uh, we got a notice from the municipality that we, we, well, at least our landlord had to start working on the foundations and had to start fixing all the structural problems because the building was at risk risk of collapse. So we closed down and we went into a process of find, figuring out what we could do, uh, discussing with the landlord what would happen to the cinema if we were going to continue operate it, on our, you know, uh, in which way we were going to do that, what the financial picture of that would be. Fortunately, we managed to completely renovate the cinema. Uh, it was almost completely torn down, as, as pa apart from the historical parts. Um, in this renovation, we managed to do a lot of things that were necessary, and in the in the whole uh, sustainability part, we managed to uh, reduce uh, operating costs and energy savings. Uh, we managed to create energy savings up to 70% compared to previous. So we went from 300,000 kilowatt hours uh, electricity use back to less than 100,000. Is now my projection. So just by completely demolishing your building and then adding insulation everywhere, you can easily make your building sustainable. Super easy. All you have to do is just break everything down and restart. And it's very easy. You just have to bring a lot of money to do that. I mean, who, who doesn't have a lot of money? So fortunately, we did have that money, but uh, we still took a long time figuring out what was the best way uh, to spend this money on the building, uh, also to make it future-proof. Uh, this wasn't just uh, like creating a new beautiful space that will make our audience happy, and that, but also thinking about what can we change about the screens and about the building in a way that it will be profitable in 10 years, in 20 years, and 30 years. Because uh, we, are, we have a landlord, we have to pay a very high rent. Unfortunately, we're paying over 25,000 euros a month just to operate this building. So we also knew we have money to spend, we can do a lot of beautiful things, but we can't do everything. That's something I'm going to touch back on uh, in the next part. But what happened during the closure is something that we didn't really expect. A lot of people 
and I'm, I'm sorry if there are spelling errors in my texts. I really did it after I got up at seven this morning. Uh, a lot of people got angry. And we were kind of surprised by that because, uh, as I said, attendance was falling back. I mean, the, 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 the cinema was beautiful, but very crummy. So we didn't expect people to care that much, but there was a huge media storm, Twitter storms, local newspaper. Uh, everybody started complaining and started to worry about what's going to happen to our favorite cinema. I used to go there all the time, which clearly wasn't true because people didn't come. But we got so much, <laughs> we got so much like positive and negative feedback on the fact that we were closing. It made us think about how attached people essentially were to that space, even though a lot of them didn't come anymore, didn't come that often, or started frequenting our, our other cinema that was just more modern, more comfortable. Uh, and we were like, okay, we have to use this to our benefit. We have to activate these people and uh, attract them to what we're doing. And of course, make them put their money where their mouth is. Oh, sorry, that's one too far. So we decided to do a crowdfunding. The first goal of this crowdfunding was ex ex actually just a marketing campaign. Using all that uproar uh, from people to uh, do something for us, to engage with them and hopefully have them engage others and activate them to support our cinema. Here again, we were surprised because in one day we raised 50,000 euro and we had a plan like we can do that maybe in nine weeks and then hopefully we'll get half of that. But it turned out to our surprise that support for our cinema was so high, especially in a neighborhood that people just started pouring money into it. So we in um, this is actually, I'm not taking credit for this, this is actually Julian's project. I mean, he managed all this and he did that. So uh, when you applaud after this, really applaud for him. Because he, he did a great job, and I think, Julian, we reached uh, the 90,000 mark in, in a week or something. Yeah. But this, you know, I, I'm saying we were surprised by it, but we didn't do this uh, without thinking it through. And that's something I wanted to give to you, because I think for everyone, specifically the kind of cinemas that we represent, uh, crowdfunding is a really cool way of killing two birds with one stone is get some money from your audience and also engage them in the struggles that you have and make them a part of uh, your problems, but also a part of your success. So my tips for get setting up a good crowdfunding, and uh, I know we have set one up, so that's why I'm going to boldly state that this is how you should do it. Um, a crowdfunding is hard, it's hard to understand. You have a lot of projects that you might want to fund, you might want a new projector, you might want to tear down your building and put insulation everywhere, but make what you're trying to fund simple, keep it tangible, something that people can understand, something that they, in my opinion at least, can point at to their friends, like, look, I did a crowdfunding and now that cool new lamp is there, or hey, this, this beautiful new carpet is something that I help fund. So that whenever they come back, they see the result of what they helped fund for you. What was also really important, and we spent a lot of time uh, on that, was finding the right platform that can help you manage the crowdfunding. Because a par large part of crowdfunding is outreach to the people that have funded, but also getting the money in, making sure the money is secure, that it's trustworthy, that people know that it actually goes to you and then it doesn't disappear. So there are lots of international platforms that help with different forms of crowdfunding. So put some effort in that and really make sure that the, the platform you're choosing is the best for you. And then plan, plan, plan. Uh, crowdfunding is essentially an extended marketing campaign. So make sure you plan ahead, make sure you make a multi-week plan, set a goal for yourself, uh, put it in time and make uh, smart steps how to keep everyone engaged and how to keep reaching out to people and tell them about your campaign. And also be multi, uh, multimedial. Make a movie, work on social media, go flyer, read, call people whose number you've got. And then that comes about down to another really important one. Almost every cinema has its own vocal influential supporters. Could be local politicians, we had some famous people because, you know, in Amsterdam, capital of the city, so a lot of like 
uh, actors knew the city, we had uh, famous musicians, and we tried to get them to also voice support for the crowdfunding and for us. And that really helped by, by uh, in improving our reach for the campaign. And whenever there's success, celebrate it, make everybody part of the success. So keep communicating with everyone. We managed to uh, raise a lot of money in the first day and we sent out a press release that was immediately picked up by the local newspaper and that just kept the fire burning. Um, but most importantly, and th that's what this is about, is capitalize on the love people have for your space. Uh, your, the, our, the, the cinema space has something sacral. Uh, it has a very emotional connection. My, I have a very emotional connection to the movies. My grandparents used to go there on their first dates in the 50s. So, I mean, that's for me, of course, I always use it a bit to, uh, to tell people how important it is, but it's a really personal connection and almost everyone who knows that cinema has that. And the older your cinema is, the easier it is, but even smaller new cinemas will have touched people in a very emotional way. And if you find out who had that emotional connection, you can extract money from them. That's so, oh yeah, that's it. And the other thing I wanted to say, I didn't make a slide for that and then I'll finish up. We did this great campaign. We reopened the cinema. We told everyone about how cool it is. And it's, it's, it's all new, but it's, it's the same, but better. Because people were really scared that the, old de the Art Deco decor uh, would disappear. So we were super happy. We opened and then the first person in a wheelchair came in. Yeah, and it was like, okay, and how, how can I go to this beautiful cinema? I always used to go there. And we were like, yeah, sorry, we completely renovated, but we're still not wheelchair accessible because it's just impossible in the building. And that's like the one sour note that we have in this whole project is, yeah, uh, this is also something that, uh, yeah, how do you say that in the right terms? It attracts a lot of emotion. Like people, you get people hyped up and invested and then there is a group of people that won't be able to get in for whatever reason. I mean, of course, our reasons are good. I'm not going to go into them, but it's really hard to manage those expectations of people. And if we had known in advance, we might have done better on this. But yeah, this is something we're struggling with now that we have completely renovated, but we're not inclusive enough. And now, well, I mean, our staff is hurting because they have to deal with a lot of abuse about it in the end. So that's it. May maybe it's the start of a new crowdfunder. Let's make <laughs> let's make the cinema accessible. Um, but yeah, no, it's interesting. There's a lot of examples in across the network of really, really successful uh, crowdfunders around physical spaces. Because it's tangible, isn't it? It's not just saying, just give us money. It's a thing, it's an object. It's um, and also around accessibility, but we, yeah, no, go on. I had a question, like, what are what are they um, not getting in return? But like, was there something that the people who participated were they like the circle of the movies, or like, are they patrons? Like, how what are their status? You know. Yeah, we had a whole like like stack of rewards that people could earn. So depending on the money you donated, you could get uh, a part of the original carpet, like a, like a dirty old piece of uh, Art Deco carpet. But that's cool. We like put it on a nice piece of paper and then it's like an, an object that you can take home. We, because the movies are so old, we already made a booklet about it when it was 100 years old. So we updated the book and then for 75 euro they would also get the book. And then the, the people that like, donated 2,000 euro get a private screening. People actually did that. So and so we had a few levels just to uh, to give people something in return. What turns out in the end, specifically the the smaller gifts, people don't pick them up. Even though we did a whole whole festival before opening for all, uh, all our uh, friends, essentially like come see the movies uh, before it opens because you donated so much money. But a lot of people didn't show up, even though they were really happy that they were invited. And now we have just boxes full of that dirty old carpet lying around. <laughs> that no one picks up. So. Great, that was a brilliant start. Thank you, Bob. Um, and we're now going to move to um, Hedvika Matanova from Czech Republic. She's going to talk about the living room where we met. Like it. 
you prefer handheld or Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Hedvika, and uh, I would like to introduce our cinema and uh, how do we live um, in the neighborhoods of Letna. It's a part of Prague where we, uh, where we are. Mm, there is a very strong community of neighborhoods, and they really know what they want from, they, from their home. And um, for example, what they really want to know, uh, what they really want is, um, for example, silent after 10 p.m. 10 p.m. So um, it may be quite challenging for us as we are settled in the bottom of apartment house. So we need to work with it and I would like to show you as oh the eye is not on the place where it meant to be. <laughs> um, I would like you to show you um, a short uh, spot we had for 10th birthday and it can show you um, the neighborhood as it is. It's a little bit of joke and it's in Czech, but I think that you can see that. I need a, there's a sound. There's a sound in this video. Is it okay? Mm -hmm. Tady bych chtěl žít každý. Okay, um, so that's the reason why I said we are living room because it was on that uh, spot that we are a living room where we where we meet. I think that uh, our neighborhoods are uh, they count on us because we are here every day and uh, the cinema was there. Uh, it has been here for 80 years, more than 80 years, and uh, they are very used to it. And I want to show you some pictures of the cinema. Uh, we have a garden. Uh, in front of the cinema during the summer. Uh, what is nice is the uh, neon uh, it with our name. We have a bar and um, the place is, uh, it's, it doesn't change a lot during the time. Uh, when you reach, uh, when, do, when you enter the cinema, uh, on the pavement level is the bar. What is for someone is the best place of the space, of course. But when the time comes and you want to uh, visit the toilet or even the cinema, or uh, if you are uh, physically disabled, you may have, uh, you may be surprised by all these stairs. You need to uh, need to climb. Uh, so. Uh, Yes, this is a picture of a neighborhood festival we do once a year for them, uh, for our neighbor neighbors to be happy with us. And um, as uh, I said, um, we are, no, we try to be uh, here for everybody. So uh, when you find us on a map, you can see that we are barrier free cinema. So uh, here you can see our platform, which is really odd, and I promise you, it's the slowest machine in the world. So if uh, two or more uh, people need to use it to go to the cinema, they really need to uh, come at the time. And <laughs> so and it may be a problem. Uh, last year, there was a few months where this thing was um, broken, and it was uh, really painful because uh, this was the time when I noticed how much people count on it because um, uh, a home for old people, a retirement ho homes called me uh, if they can come uh, uh, to visit us for senior screenings but they don't dare it without uh, uh, this platform so it, uh, I think it's important to have it and uh, it needs to work correctly. <laughs> uh, we 
really try to have a place for everybody. You can uh, we have a lot of space for uh, senior pro projection. Uh, we have a baby bear once a week for young uh, people with babies. Uh, there's a lot of space for uh, children. You can come with your dog. We have a place for Ukrainian community. We have. Uh, we, we really try to have a place for everybody who needs and who wants. And I think we we do it. And uh, while I'm talking about people in cinema, in my opinion, it can be a little ecological disaster because of all the waste. So I would like to talk about these reusable cups uh, we used for many, many years, but still people can be upset about it. Um, there's a deposit and they sometimes they don't understand why we do it uh, or we don't use straws, which it's not something would save a planet, but we can uh, tell the people that it's important to uh, do not produce too much waste or more than is necessary. Uh, we sometimes uh, on Christmas or on summer we made a marriage from something we don't need, and we um, we have like old banner. Uh, maybe you noticed that uh, it was on a building. So when the banner is nice. Um, we can make a merch. This is a beach, beach bag. Um, what you really need in the middle of Europe when you don't have a beach. <laughs> <laughs> and there is a diary uh, from old posters. I don't lie, you, uh, they don't buy it a lot, but we have it, and we can show people that it's possible to do something with with uh, with these things. Um, so we try to think about uh, what we do in this place and. We try to be sustainable in this in these things, and uh, still, uh, while I'm talking to not produce a lot of waste, uh, we still have these very nice um, tickets that people really really like, and it's something they can take with uh, uh, with them to keep the memory of of this of this. And that's it. So many beautiful ideas in there, and yeah. it's really nice to see your space. It's really stunning, mm -hmm. and the work that you're doing with lots of different target groups as well is really impressive. Did anyone have any questions at all, or do we move on to the next bit? Yeah. Because uh, I I like the idea about creating uh, swag out of like used stuff. So you create a bags out of banners. They, we've We've done that too, but is that something like y you set your staff to create them yourselves or did you reach out to someone? Is there some tips you can give on creating that? Because I think that's cool for everyone to do. Uh, to do this stuff? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, the recycling. So like we mm, they just do what they, they, they I think that they feel it. like. Mm. But is I, it I don't know if I understand the question. Well, did you... Did do you make them yourself, or do you have like uh, an artist to yes, do it? Yes, there was some artist, someone who made these things. We don't make it by our own. Okay. Yeah, and again, there's some really nice examples. There's a cinema called Casablanca in Germany that do really, really nice bags as well. Um, and th yeah, there's loads of examples, but it's it's great. Yeah, thank you. Um, the app. Go back to the app. Um, okay, and now, um, ah, we're going to Watershed. <laughs> Yay. Um, so you're going to see a little bit of um, my cinema through the eyes of uh, Steph, who's joined the team fairly recently, um, joined us through um, initially an MA in curation program that we run each year, and is now a cinema assistant, soon to be in charge of everything. Uh, oh, there we go. 
Um, as Maddie said, I'm Steph. I work on the cinema program at Watershed um, in Bristol. Um, I don't know how much Maddie has said about the cinema where she works, but um, we're a three screen cinema um, with also a cafe bar and a digital research space attached called the Pervasive Media Studio, um, which is run in collaboration with several universities. And it actually, we own these two kind of sheds on the harbour. They're late 19th century warehouses. Um, and we leased out the bottom floor for additional income to bars um, and we occupy the top that you can see, the blue bit, um, which is where all the cinemas are. Um, so this is, um, this is our foyer. So part of the challenge with occupying a space like this is um, the, our only ground floor street level presence is this foyer, uh, which is our box office and ticketing place. And because then to get to the cafe bar on the screens, you have to get people up the stairs, which is kind of one of the biggest challenges, I think, in that people aren't always aware it's a cinema as well. Um, so this refurbishment of the box office about five years ago, um, that other pictures from the 90s, um, was designed to kind of make it a more welcoming space and to break down these kind of barriers that, you know, it felt quite fenced off and formal with the physical, you know, ticketing booth glass bits. Um, and also we've tried to make a statement um, over the last few years with the renovation like this in terms of visual signs that we're a space for everyone and to kind of get across our desire to be an accessible and inclusive space, as you can see with like our stair strips there, which we hadn't installed for um, our partnership with Queer Vision, which is our Pride Film Festival. Um, and they stay up year round as kind of a statement of the kind of space we want to be. Um, and these, this is also a recent <laughs> refurbishment, which was, um, <laughs> we, we also did a fundraising campaign for this. It was to refurbish our toilets to make them gender neutral. Um, so that was a campaign, I think, for about a year, and we did this kind of crowdfunding online and a big marketing push to try and get people to donate to it. And again, it was also a statement of the kind of space we wanted to create. And um, these are public toilets as well. And in Bristol, there's not that many public kind of publicly accessible toilets in the city centre. So we actually, especially in the summer, we get a lot of people coming into the building just to use the toilets, which seems weird, but it's a good kind of way of raising awareness of, you know, your cinema upstairs because you're getting people in the door. <laughs> um, and also they're very nice toilets. Um, and as part of the um, fundraising as well, we then created, um, we have a kind of ticker board up in the cafe bar as a way of like recognizing everyone who donated to that project, um, which lists all our donors. It's like um, the ticket boards you'd get at train stations with the flapping bits. I mean, the sound it drives the cafe bar stuff absolutely insane, but um, it's a nice kind of way that people can then see their contribution reflected in the space. Um, this is our cafe bar that I've mentioned, which kind of sits at the heart of the building. Um, and you can see the cinemas down the hallway at the far side um, and the pervasive media studio, the digital space sits to the left. Um, and this has also undergone refurbishment. It had a very kitschy kind of um, film reel inspired look back in the 80s. Everything was just covered in film reels. <laughs> it's, I wish I'd got a picture of it now to see. But anyway. Yeah, it, w it was kind of obscene. They just plastered it all over there. Um, so the cafe bar is a really key space for us in terms of um, moving our audience uh, between the spaces. So we get a lot of people that just come to the cafe bar f as, and treat it as a restaurant and a meeting space. And it's how can we get that group of people to come and actually see the films in the cinema? And also how can we move our audience who come to the cinema across to the cafe bar for financial reasons, <laughs> reasons as well? Ooh. Um, ugh, to get them to spend more money, frankly. <laughs> So some of the ways we do this is by programming across the spaces. So some of it's linked in with the cinema program. Like this, these are pictures from an event that we did as part of um, our Rep Film Fest last year, Cinema Rediscovered, which Maddie also works on, where we had um, a local visual artist and DJ, he projection mapped onto the wall. So it was really kind of rooted in the space and using it, you know, um, amplifying the fact that it, we are in a warehouse. This is the space we have and working with that. Um, and so he did a DJ set or audio visual set inspired by Lost Highway, um, which then meant that a lot of people from that screening came across the cafe bar and it created this kind of festival environment as well. Um, 
these are some other uses of the cafe bar that we do. So the fact that we have such a big social space at the center of the building is really helpful for when you're hosting festivals. Like I love Glasgow Film Festival, but the fact that they don't have a proper like large cafe social space in the GFT means that then all the networking happens in the hotel, which can make it feel a bit removed and gives less of a cohesive sense of this is a festival, this is where everything's happening. Um, Whereas we're quite lucky to have this space and we try to make the most of it. So we op host opening night launch parties and we have like music in there. Again, to bring in a different audience, we often get quite a more diverse audience for the music events that we host in there. And they often come along to the screening too. And that's normally a new audience for us each time, which is really um, good to see. And another way we use the space is these um, kind of conversations about cinema. So again, that's linked with the cinema program and it's to encourage people to move throughout the space and you know keep them engaged with our whole offering uh, and to signpost the pervasive media studio stuff so we have um deaf conversations about cinema which happens once a month and we do a ds screening um descriptively subtitled screening of a film one evening and then we um have two bsl interpreters who then um kind of host a discussion um you know, it's not like a, it's not direct to Q and A. It's just a uh, informal discussion in the cafe bar from everyone who's seen the film. But you know, it's open to everyone. You don't have to be deaf to attend. And in fact, there are quite a few people who turn up just to have that conversation. Um, uh, these are some of the challenges of being in, the <laughs> you know, being in the warehouse. Like I've said, um, oh, there's also the leaky roof, but there's not a good picture of that. But um, this is a downstairs space that we do have, um, which is under shed here, um, which is something that we're looking to renovate soon to kind of use it as an immersive space because we're looking at branching out our programming into um, beyond the conventional idea of the cinema into immersive experiences, whether that's VR, whether that's more of like an installation type thing. Um, but again, it's the difficulty of fundraising partly um, and also just the practicalities of it's a listed building and there are limited changes we can make and there's a lot of sound bleed through in the building um, and this is also another kind of issue is that our pervasive media studio if we're trying to link up all our programming across the cinema and the digital media studio it doesn't help that our studio is down the end of i mean this is the second corridor there's three three double doors before that and two corridors it's really segmented off so it's a real challenge to actually get people to engage with our program across those areas, um, just from a physical aspect as much as anything. Um, so that's my short summary of how we try to use our social spaces. Some of the challenges that we have that are kind of inherent in the building um, and things that we're trying to do moving forwards, like this opening up of this ground floor space, which could hopefully attract um, a more casual audience that are passing by. Thanks, Steph. That was great. Has anyone got any questions, comments? No. It, 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 yeah. The, uh, the online friends. I was just wondering about the uh, events once a month, uh, the deaf conversations. You, did you say that there was an interpreter during the the actual screening of the film? So the film is descriptively subtitled, but we have the interpreters there from the start because then they interpret um, the introduction because we normally get someone to come in and like a guest speaker who's a bit more knowledgeable on the film or has some relation to it or a specialist who kind of um, provides the focus for the conversation afterwards as well and like provocations, etc. Um, and then the whole discussion afterwards is BSL interpreted and that normally lasts for about an hour and an hour and a half in the cafe bar and people then tend to stay later. but. Um, and carry on the discussion themselves. It's not a cheap thing. <laughs> I'll just say it's not a cheap thing, but it's very it's getting more more and more popular, and the team have really bought into it, where they've they start coming to animate some of the conversations, and it's part of a whole wider thing we're doing around BSL. Like all the front of our house team is trained, and that first in that first screen that Steph showed. Um, in, when you arrive into the venue, there's a permanent um, welcome in BSL as well that explains what the cinema is. So that was quite a cheap thing.
thing to do actually because we did it once and now it means whenever s someone that's deaf that comes into the building that's they see something for them from the entrance onwards um, but it did come out of a program of uh, we had a residency with someone that is um, deaf it came out of that so there was quite a long program that led to this um, yeah right no, sorry <laughs> So can I can you maybe tell us a little bit? I mean, the time is short, but like, how does the process in your organization work? Like, how do you involve people in changing these spa the spaces? How do you plan it? Is there like a step by step process or whatever? Yeah. Um, a lot of the decision making is made in the bar, as Maddie points out. <laughs> um, but no, with with spaces like the development of Undershared, that's a big consultation project, and we're working with um, someone who creates VR um, and who works with Anagram, and they, you know, they've premiered their last um, piece at LFF, and they're a resident in our media studio. So again, it's using those connections between the digital researchers that we have and how we can get their thoughts on how best to develop that space, and you know, working alongside the architects to see what's actually um, possible, because we want it to be as open a space as possible so we can use it for so many different things you know we don't want to be like sending ourselves into oh it works for VR experiences and then for things to develop past that in terms of immersive exhibitions and us to be stuck in oh we've got a space for VR do you know what I mean yeah and it also builds on a, an experiment we've had a VR cinema for a year underneath in one of those spaces um, so I think now we really want to move away from VR into more immersive experiences, which is where the audience seems to be leaning towards. Um, and it's a pilot, isn't it? And we, we, you know, there's a lot of uh, public funding going into this type of work. And the problem they have is they've got no places to show it afterwards. Um, so Anagram won the Venice Biennale thing with their piece, but where can they show it um, back in the UK? So I think that that is a p potential, you know, area for cinemas to think about, and it's not easy. Uh, the business model for VR certainly isn't there, I can tell you. Um, but immersive, you can start thinking, yeah, maybe people going into a space where stuff is projected in a different way. Right, thank you so much, Steph. That's great. Um, and now we're going to Admiral Kino in Austria, Sofia Zaglul. Did I say that correctly? Yeah. yeah. Do you prefer handheld or? So hello everyone, I'm Sophia and today I would like to talk to you about um, rethinking your cinema space in order to improve your footprint in a historical building space because af as we've heard before lots of our cinemas are located in historical building spaces and um, it sometimes seems like a challenge to become a more sustainable and inclusive place but I think that in order to preserve the magic of cinema we also have to think about like not only think about programming, but also about our um, physical space in order to become more sustainable and inclusive. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned um, the first day, Admiral Kino has a long history. It has opened 110 years ago. Um, on the pictures you can see a little bit how it has changed um, during time. I don't know exactly what year the first picture was taken, but the second one was like in the 80s and on the right you can see what it looks like now. Um, as Bob also mentioned before, if you're running a cinema that has a long history like that, there are a lot of people who have um, like an emotional or sentimental connection with it. Um, we also call this cinema like a local supplier or neighborhood cinema. So they're really, most of our um, customers are from our neighborhood. And um, 
as I said before, we only um, took over the cinema in the beginning of this year, but what we could notice, um, or like we heard a lot of stories of people coming by and um, telling us that they're very happy um, that the cinema is not closing down because they have known it for years or have been coming there with their parents or grandparents. And so, yeah, the um, challenge for us is now how to improve the infrastructure and um, becoming more sustainable without losing these customers because, yeah, also, as Bob said before, people don't always react positively to change. <laughs> um, but sometimes you just have to be a little bit radical and um, start fresh, and that's what we're trying to do now. So um, I want to tell you about some of the um, initiatives for inclusion and sustainability that we're working on right now. Um, we are currently working on becoming a certified eco-friendly business um, because there is like an um, eco mark, I don't know how to translate it, it's called the Österreichisches Umweltzeichen. So there's a certification for businesses who are a certif certificate for um, businesses which are sustainable and eco-friendly. Um, so right now we are of course, thinking about our resources, um, the responsible use of water. We switched to um, green power immediately um, and also are trying to um, um, to obtain our snacks and drinks from more local suppliers. We also um, reduced the range of um, snacks and drinks that we offer in order to switch to a higher quality um, product and we were really looking into what people really buy and what we can probably kick out of the range. <laughs> um, then of course we are looking into waste reduction. Um, we completely got rid of all um, plastic bottles and cups and switched to glass um, bottles and are trying to educate um, our staff, but also um, our audiences um, in waste separation and recycling. Of course, packaging is a big um, topic um, that is still to be managed. It's an ongoing process. Um, and also, yeah, big question of um, print marketing we already talked about like a few days ago about digital marketing and print marketing. And um, so we're really thinking about what we can, like how we can avoid too much print marketing. I personally, yeah, I love print paper. <laughs> I love print, but um, sometimes you have to let go of some things that you think you need or love for the greater good. So it's also possible without producing too much um, paper waste. Um, then of course uh, mobility is also um, a big question. We are very lucky to um, be located in um, a district with um, great infrastructure. So there's a lot of public transport um, around our cinema. Uh, also a lot of parking spaces for bikes, which you could see in the photo um, that I showed you before. Um, but regarding mobility, of course, you also have to take in consideration your means of um, transportation for pub uh, business travel um, in order to reduce your footprint. And um, lastly, of course, we're also trying to build awareness um, about sustainability to our audiences um, um, with special screenings and talks about, um, for example, biodiversity and um, certain collaborations um, with our government. Actually, we're also lucky that um, the district our cinema is located in is led by the Green Party. So um, 
they're on our side and also um, having some great initiatives. And um, yeah, so we're working closely um, in collaboration with them. Um, then on the other hand, um, we're also trying to uh, be more inclusive um, with our programming as well. Um, I mentioned um, on the first day that um, regarding our programming, we are um, putting our focus on a very um, feminist cinema and on um, films um, by women um, filmmakers. But feminism also means to us that we want to include all people. It's not always possible to include everyone, but so we are trying our best. And um, we started some collaborations with um, um, with an uh, initiative for senior citizens, which is called Generation Plus. So four times a year, we are having free screenings for senior citizens, which they seem to really enjoy because it's a nice way for them to connect to um, um, to um, benefit from um, social and cultural activities. And then on the other hand, we are also um, proposing free screenings for children in cooperation with Cinemini on Tour. I don't know if any one of you knows Cinemini Europe. It's an um, educative cinema program for um, really young children from the age um, from three to six. So um, they created a program, I think um, the whole, it's um, like a one hour program, but they're very short movies for two minutes. And they are, um, um, there's a, an educator also in the room who explains um, <coughs> what was happening on the screen. Um, and um, another point is uh, that we um, are, like in Austria, there's a great initiative for people with, um, for socially disadvantaged people or people with low income. It is called Hunger of Kunst und Kultur, and it provides um, like free tickets or reduced price tickets for these people. So we're also a partner um, of this initiative. Um, then coming back to our physical space, I guess um, during the pandemic, many of us had to think outside the box or outside the screening room. <laughs> so. Um, we also created or built an outdoor area. Um, it was built last year by our previous owner. Um, there were a few challenges because it's a really large area. You cannot see all of it on the photo. And it was not um, very inviting because there was basically nothing on it apart from a few chairs and uh, no one really used it. So um, we got a lot of complaints by our neighbors um for all of that lost parking space um but we are currently fighting to get it back uh we have to reduce the size um and um uh, but in revenge um for the <laughs> lost space we now um apply to get more um bike parking spaces and um, we already got the confirmation that we will get them so that's a win and um, yeah so this outdoor area is of course a great uh, platform for interactions with neighbors um, it's a meeting spot for guests we will try to um, put a little more life in it and to um, make it greener and so in the literal sense of greening, um, we are also um, taking part in this great initiative um, in Vienna, which is called Garteln ums Eck. It means like gardening around the corner. So um, the city actually planted a lot of new trees over the last um, few years. And um, around these trees, um, there is uh, some free space that um, people can use to plant 
um, like to make their own garden. So you can apply and become like a patron of this space. And so Admiral Kino is also um, doing that. What you can see here, I didn't do anything this year. This just um, it grew like that. Yeah, <laughs> it's really green. It's like our little urban garden. And so which is what is also important, of course, here is that we cannot plant um, any invasive or unlocal plants. Um, but it's a great a way of um, preserving biodiversity. And um, yeah, very happy to have this. OK, just um, very quickly, I'm talking about the challenges uh, which are coming with all of that. Um, if you are located in an old building, um, it is sometimes hard to um, get the permit for um, construction, so our building is not fully accessible. Um, we have no wheelchair-friendly toilets. And um, as many uh, old buildings, also our building is under um, preservation order, so um, we cannot, unfortunately, do everything we like. Um, and of course, maintenance in an old building is al also a big question. And um, regarding inclusion, of course, um, for me, a big question is uh, in times of rising costs, um, how can we keep our prices low enough um, in order not to exclude people with lower income? So yeah, it's an ongoing process, but it can be done. I was just to uh, ask you very quickly uh, about the free tickets. Do you what is uh, how do you manage that in terms of economics for the free screening and the free tickets? Do you uh, have uh, subsidized from your own cinema or you do have uh, ex external uh, finan fundings? Um, so the free screenings for seniors and kids, actually they are um, funded by the organizations who are organizing these screenings. So the, for the seniors it's actually um, an like, um, organization also from the Green Party for their older citizens and they kind of um, they rent the cinema. And um, same for the kids, like Cine Mini on Tour is um, funded by the, um, they get funding from the state. Um, but with Hunger of Kunst und Kultur, um, actually you can become a partner of this initiative and then you have to um, fund the tickets. Like every organization, if you have a limited um, number of seats, then you can choose how many free tickets you want to give away. Like museums, they have unlimited uh, amount of free tickets for people. And if you're interested in those kind of models, there's a lot of examples. Le Méliès does some really good work around like uh, patrons buying tickets for people. There's there's all sorts of different approaches and schemes. Um, so ask the, the Europa Cinemas team to put you in touch. Um, that, that was really inspiring. So much thought, so much thought has gone into it. And it's nice to see some of the small ideas that are being implemented. Um, Last but not least, uh, welcome Yang Yang, uh, who didn't manage to do an introduction at the start, but he's going to start by um, introducing themselves all the way from Beijing. Well, we we are very happy to have you here, <laughs> and we have a special reason.
finally ad arranging this for me so I can have a chance to introduce myself and what I do in China. Uh, I, uh, I'm from Beijing. Uh, actually, uh, I was about to participate in this lab, but uh, you know, I had I need to have a visa to travel to Europe, so it took me a very long time to get my visa. I only received it on Monday, <laughs> so I wasn't able. I wasn't sure if I could come or not. So that's why I confirmed to the Europa Cinema very late. So I got only two days to prepare for the trip. So that's uh, why I'm like this. <laughs> uh, so I work uh, for a Hong Kong-based film uh, production and the distributing company called Echo Films. I think our most famous production is uh, The Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon by Andy. So the film won the Oscar many years ago. And this, uh, this company, film, uh, Edco Films, also running a, a cinema circle called Broadways. We have a different brand, cinema brand. It's Broadway Cinemas and the Palace and also Broadway Cinematheque. Broadway Cinematheque is our art house cinema uh, brand. Uh, that's what that was my job. Uh, we have uh, in total more than 50 cinemas uh, in mainland China and uh, in Hong Kong. And we have Broadway Cinematheque in Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong. Uh, so um, maybe I, I, I need to explain a little bit about the Chinese market because the Chinese market is totally different from yours. <laughs> Uh, I think before the, the COVID, we used to be the second biggest uh, film market of the world, uh, but the market is not open. We, uh, I think the number in 2019, only uh, 128 foreign film got the, how to say, the official release in cinema in, China, in mainland China. I'm talking about mainland China because Hong Kong is totally different. And the number last year was uh, only uh, 53, but because 2022 was uh, unusual, there was the big election, so so only uh, 53 foreign film got uh, officially released uh, in cinema in China. But this year things are getting a little bit better. Uh, so apart from this uh, quota <laughs> and the censorship, uh, and also apart from the uh, official international film festival like in Beijing, in Shanghai, those are run by the government, the National Film Ministry. Uh, what we can do in our daily life to show foreign film is uh, we can do mini package of uh, showcase of one country, uh, about 10 to 12 films. Uh, it can be old, it can be classic films, like a retrospective. It can also be a showcase of a new film since two years. Uh, and uh, each time we have to go to the film censorship of the local uh, film bureau to ask for permission. They will, uh, they will see the content of the film and they will see if uh, the country is in good relationship with China. <laughs> and each time uh, the, the program uh, can only uh, last no more than 10 days and uh, only two or three screenings for one film. And if I want to tour the same program to another city, I have to ask for permission again to the local censorship. <laughs> but uh, we managed to tour some of our program in more than 15 cities in mainland China. So in total, it's, uh, it's still a big amount of uh, screenings. It's like a mini distribution. It's not official release, but it's uh, something. <laughs> Uh, maybe I will go to uh, show you some picture. You already seen that. Uh, I didn't know there was a music. <laughs> uh, so the this this one uh, is our cinema in Beijing. Uh, it's the smallest one. Uh, we have only three screening rooms and in total four hundred three seats. The biggest screening hall. We had 196 seats. Uh, the cinema is uh, located in a very fancy residency. It's called MoMA. <laughs> 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 the same MoMA in New, New York. So sometimes people got confused. They, they, they forget our brand. They just say, I, want to, I will go to see a movie at MoMA this morning, uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, tonight. Um, the architect of this residency and also our cinema is 
an, an American guy, I don't remember his name. So actually the landlord of this residence in MoMA, uh, he aimed to sell his apartment to the rich people. So uh, 15 years ago, he went to Hong Kong because in Hong Kong, our Broadway cinema uh, in Hong Kong was also the, the first uh, uh, independent art house cinema in Hong Kong. It was a very important landmark in the city. So they went to visit the BC in Hong Kong and they want to uh, bring back the same concept. So they, they, he, want, he, he went to see my boss and try to persuade him to come to Beijing because for my boss, his name is Bill Kong, he's the producer of the, the famous film. Uh, he thinks it's uh, important to have at least the one art house movie theater in the capital of one country, it's important. That's why he created the, this brand in Hong Kong. So in uh, 2009, uh, end of 2009, we opened this uh, first Broadway Cinemac Tech in Beijing. But at the, first, uh, at the beginning, he didn't know he cannot do the same thing as he, 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 he does in Hong Kong. Uh, here we can only register that as an ordinary cinema. That means you cannot decide what you want to show. You have to go to the censorship and uh, each time you have to ask for permission. Otherwise you can only show the, the Chinese films or the other 100 foreign films got the official permit. Uh, so it's turned out that it's, uh, we have to live with the reality. <laughs> Uh, but uh, with the, but the, the, this the, this residency is uh, uh, on the other uh, one hand there's real people living in the residency, and on the other hand uh, there's a lot of uh, office and especially uh, office of a film small film company and a studio for artists. So it's an area for the cultural people to to come. So we have a very mixed audience of uh, well-educated and rich cultural people and the normal resident <laughs> of this district. And uh, this is the second floor of the, we have uh, th three floors. The first, of, uh, first floor is the counter tickets office and the second floor we have a special space. We call it the library and the video deck. And uh, now you see it's an open space, but actually we have uh, folding doors. You can close this space uh, and use it as a screening room, uh, also as a space for talks, a seminar. And you so also when a celebra celebrity or officials from the embassy, they come, they can have a place for their own to prepare for some interviews or maybe do some makeup thing. And uh, we, have, we also have a membership system, so the, our member, they can lend the books and the video DVDs for, for free. This is the other side of the second floor. We can use it as an exhibition, uh, exhibition uh, space. We can also host a reception or cocktail from sometimes for the opening of a retrospective or a film program. Uh, though it's very difficult to get the censorship permission for a, pro a film program, but once we can, we got it, we can do it great. <laughs> and because my problem is uh, uh, first, how to get the censorship permission and then how to satisfy all the audience because I don't have enough seats. Our ticketing system crush every time. The people, <laughs> people usually got angry when they cannot buy the, the seats they want. Uh, this is uh, pictures of some of the events we did in the past years. The uh, Japanese animation and the uh, retrospective of Takashi Kitano and this uh, was the retrospective of the Daden brothers because um, 
as I explained, uh, for the government, this kind of uh, cultural event is not in considered as a cultural event, considered as a something diplomatic. So usually when there's a big year for the diplomatic relationship between China of this country, it's, more, it's easier to get the censorship permission. So I did this two years ago. It was the 50th anniversary of the uh, diplomatic relationship between Belgium and China. So I got the <laughs> permission <laughs> very easy and invited the, the brothers to do the online uh, Zoom sharing with the public. They were very nice. We did it twice. We did the retrospective in Beijing and Shenzhen and Shanghai. But sometimes uh, the problem is uh, uh, the government, the film censorship, they demand a kind of a cultural rich, uh, reciprocity for this kind of event. That means uh, this time I host the, the films from your country, 10 films, 20 screenings. You have to show Chinese film next year in your country, at least 10 films. Uh, it depends on the city. City like Beijing or Guangdong, they are more open, so and they don't really force us to do this. But in the city of Shanghai, it's a uh, must. So actually, I'm looking for some uh, partners to do this <laughs> retros reciprocity because we especially for Belgium and also for Poland. And also last year we did the Wim Windows and uh, the uh, next month we are going to pre uh, present a retrospective for Ennio Morricone. So also Italy, I'm looking for partners. <laughs> maybe not for this year, maybe for next year, but I have to do something. Yeah. We also do a lot of master class because we are the first and maybe still the only uh, private art house cinema brand in mainland China. So once we can do something, all the big names that they want to come and uh, and join and share with the public. So this is what we did in the. This is this was be before he won the at Cannes Film Festival. Corrieda. Yeah, uh, I think I, I'm I'm about to. To well, just uh, some picture. This was uh, the retrospective of uh, Claire uh, uh, Chantal Carman. So we invited his uh, editor to do a sharing, online sharing with uh, Claire Anston. Yeah, this was uh, Claude Lelouch. We work a lot with the embassies and uh, organizations like Uni France and uh, German Films, Japan Foundation to get their support, a little bit of financial support as well. This is some pictures of what we can do with the exhibition area. Yeah, that's it. And uh, I also brought some uh, of our merchandising stuff. Uh, for those, if you like, uh, Bruce Lee. I have, <laughs> I have the badge for Bruce Lee. This is from the film, uh, the, the, the Revenge of the Dragon. Last year was the uh, 50th anniversary yeah. of that film. I think it was we shown. We're screening it now at our if cinema. You, want, you can have this. And this is the ticket pocket for the Ennio Morricone. So you can have it. Beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's been, you know, like really fascinating <laughs> hearing to, hearing how you get around the censorship. I think, you know, we all have talked about limitations, but this takes it to another level. <laughs> um, and it's it's interesting to think how creative you can be even within um, those restrictions. Um, so I think it's a really good thing to end on and to give us a sense of perspective. Yeah. And so also this is, uh, for, for, for those who fancy still handwriting oh letters, wow. you can this also is have beautiful. this. This is for the retrospective of Tanaka Kinuyu. Yeah. So this and and that one is available if you if you want through uh, Janus. Um, in the US, they've got the international rights. I think is no, it no, for is, China. is it China only? Oh no, no I'm confusing it with someone. But it's very expensive. It's expensive. It's okay. Very expensive. It, it, actually, this uh, we got the inspiration from the film Love Letter. It's a debut oh, film of nice. Tanaka Kinu. This is the most expe expensive screening fee I've ever paid. Oh so rem in memory of that, I did this. <laughs> <laughs> a very expensive <laughs> paper. paper. It's uh, very nice yeah. to have it. <laughs> yeah. If you want, you can Great. give it to me. Thank you so much.
There is light, there is light, and there is coffee. We've got quite a lot of time. Yeah, I think we've time. Um. We need the sound guy. Can we get the sound guy? Where's the sound guy? Uh, I don't dare to do it. I will put some pictures on the pic uh, the pieces because they sent some uh, Okay. Okay. Yeah. Do you know uh, which groups? Uh, I've got group five and uh, I asked the other one but uh, I don't know yet. Well, we'll just go with group one then. Yeah. yeah. Hey everybody, welcome back. Um, I hope you enjoyed that challenge. And I'm really, really excited to see like the, the problems you face, but then the solutions that you've come up with as a group. Um, so we're gonna start with group one. So if you can set the scene, set the problem, and then yeah. the do solution. Need, uh, do you need so something to write on, or will you just do a verbal presentation? can uh, find a picture of our cinema to me, uh, but it's not necessary. Uh, it's Bea Oko. Yes. So may I start? Um, with the group one, uh, we decided to solve a problem uh, of Bea Oko and a um, massive loss of energy we have because um, of uh, heating the coffee. Because maybe, as you are going to see, we have a lot of doors um, which... Um, and through these doors, they are old, uh, it's all of it is eight years old, so... Um, there, the the air goes through all these doors, and it's very expensive and difficult for us to heat this place, um, uh, because and and we, what are we talking about? Is um, what are we worried worried about? Is um, price of energies, because it's uh, this winter was very difficult for us to heat the coffee, but not so much. Uh, and still keep people inside. So if you uh, s uh, see the cinema, the front, uh, we, we talk about the coffee, not about the screening hall, and um, there are a lot of these doors, and uh, also we have this glass, mm, I call it looks fair, but um, as I noticed, it's not an uh, it's not international word, um, it's like uh, glass bricks. And uh, what is our problem is that um, it's it's going to be uh, very expensive. Uh, so we uh, would like to make a crowdfunding uh, with a deal with the city, uh, and we think that um, when we um, collect um, some part of the money, the city will help us with the rest. And uh, we also would like to ask Europa Cinemas uh, us <laughs> to pay it because. Um, it can help our cinema be more green, and uh, what is um, I think what is going to be challenging for us is um, people from monument protection. I think because it needs to it needs to look like it looks n now, but it must be more function functional. Uh, I think we really we really need to have a double double glass in these doors, and it needs to fit uh, in the space where it is. So, that's it. Thanks. And did, did anyone else have any other sort of tips or, um, for the project? I mean, I know in, in Germany there's a lot of work that's been done on um, buildings and retrofitting, and so there might be some good ideas. Um, uh, the Cinema Casablanca is really worth talking to they've done a lot of work around there and it's an old cinema it's a quite a small old cinema but they've done a, a lot around the environment but yeah that sounds really good, good maybe sir. maybe also as another tip look at any greening subsidies that maybe the government has or yeah. the european commission they start to hand out way more subsidies for uh, building improvements yeah because it's becoming a legal 
requirements um, in European law. With Europa Cinemas, I don't want to be like, no, you won't get any money, but it, there isn't currently a scheme for um, sustainability, but it's something that's really worth, I would bring it up with you mentioning it to the board, because we now have the sustainability charter and we have um, a couple of other charters around um, uh, kind of gender parity and inclusion. So that's the beginning of that journey to just have an intention, but it might be that we could go to the commission as a sector through Europa Cinemas to say, is there some subsidy? Like many years ago, they managed to get some subsidy for, um, uh, it was for access. So there were pots of money for access, but usually capital funding tends to be national funding rather than European funding on the whole, unless there's sometimes a big intervention. Um, yeah, but yeah, looking at local subsidies. Thanks. That's great. Yeah. Group number two. Well. Thank you. Okay, so um, we chose our uh, our cinema summer cinema for the problematic part. Uh, basically, it's our new project. We haven't done a summer cinema in this part of the town before. And it's good because there's a lot of people hanging around in the evenings already, so we don't really have to look for the audience. They're already there. It's just getting them interested in cinema. Uh, but also, it's located in a very snob area, so there's a lot of rich people who don't want anything to happen there. And um, they want they want everything to be silent by 10 o'clock in the evening. But our summer cinema starts at 10 uh, because it, it won't get dark before. Um, but we mm, thought about it and silent disco, like headphones, is a very nice solution to that. And basically, your if you buy a ticket for them for the cinema, it's really simple. You get uh, you get a seat because there's a seating area for a hundred people, so your ticket includes the e earphones and the seating. Then we have another problem because of the snob area. There's no transportation because it uh, the part of the town was designed that way, so everybody just drives with their car. But we do have a lot of. Um, um, the people who don't have their own car and also Tallinn is like the green uh, capital of Europe at the moment so <laughs> you know so we thought about it and um, maybe we can do some public transportation in um, with, with cooperating with the city only for the evenings when the summer cinema is there so from Thursday evenings to Sunday evenings and that's about it because we do have a lot of people who, okay, they drive bikes, they have like, we have those public scooters, but old people, they don't, they don't drive them, so it's the bus is the best thing for them. Now, there's also the weather. Uh, so if the weather gets moody, it's right by the sea, so it's going to happen. We do have our second hall right by there, so we can move the um, screening inside, it's quite simple. Um, yep, and then how to make it more inclusive. Uh, we thought about it. Um, we came up with a solution to add, for example, a second channel uh, for the headphones with uh, this uh, descriptive dialogues, so that also the blind people could, you know, hear the film, and yeah, and also, well, the deaf people can come and have a look as well. So, uh, yeah, this is basically it, the summer cinema with a lot of small, very solvable problems. Yeah. Thank you. Well, oh, that's a that's a good use of technology. Yeah, yeah. those different audio channels. Uh, easy way to be be inclusive in that level. So, uh, smart idea. Awesome. Do you want to add anything? Just say I think it's really smart when you can find a solution that works for all your audience as well as, you know, that that deaf audience. The, you know, that it be that's inclusion, isn't it? And I think it's great. Well done. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience wants to make a remark? Otherwise, we'll go on to group number three of our. That's. Ah. <laughs> yeah, quite flexible. 
Hello everybody. Uh, our method was to just talk about our specific uh, cinemas and I tried to distill two interesting case studies from that. So here we go. So we had four cases basically. Two were about money, one for isolation, one for one more screening uh, uh, screen. Uh, but we found that less interesting uh, because it's not an easy, easily solvable problem. So we went for the two cases in which the physical space also interacts with how your audience perceives your cinema, right? It's also about the brand you're building. So let me take you to Palma de Mallorca. You can close your eyes. There's palm trees. <laughs> There's cold water, yeah. There's a young, energetic Ernesto running around his uh, art house cinema. Four screens. <laughs> we see it here. And the uh, status quo is that the ticket desk, so the place where you can buy your tickets, it's outside of the, of the cinema, basically. Um, we all found that very nice, uh, because it's, you know, it feels like a, like a train station or like a, uh, like a roller coaster park where you, where you stand outside. But the managers think otherwise. Um, it's not good for the workflow. The person selling tickets has to communicate via uh, a walkie-talkie with the projectionist, etc. It's not, it's not effective. Um, yeah, so that was one case, I think. Uh, we love this, but yeah. It's also about, I think, what you, how you want your cinema to be perceived. And we like the attraction park look, in a way. Oh, yeah, well, I, I propose what if you do a survey among your audience or a poll via Instagram or whatever to see what they actually think. Do they prefer a better workflow or do they uh, like the, 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 the theme park vibe? Um, second case is Bristol. Um, and I think this is interesting because it's about a sense of ownership amongst your audience. Um, so there was a crowdfund for gender neutral toilets. You saw them in uh, Steph's presentation. Um, this creates a feeling among the audience, I guess, that um, a strong feeling, well, in a good way, because they think I, I made this happen in a way. But there also was a lot of online backlash from, uh, well, let's say an anti-trans part of society. So y you can see the two sides of ownership, I guess, or a sense of o ownership in a good way and a bad way. Interestingly, Steph said, there was a debate organized about these toilets and about people, you know, backlashing in, but nobody showed up. Online, uh, only online, it was crazy, yeah. So that were, there were, yeah, that were our two case studies, not really challenges or um, things solved. That's great, thank you. Watershed, did they shut them down? It no, it doesn't stop. Yeah, there's, and it's interesting because we, it's actually, uh, there's like a fraction of like feminists that are very militant about it, even though we have options. You know, we have gender toilets, we have neutral toilets. Um, but I think we made some mistakes at the beginning. Okay. Yeah, at the start. It wasn't always designed in a nice way that Steph showed, showed it on the picture. At the beginning, we just had the normal toilets. We took the signs off, and it was like gender neutral, and it wasn't done well. So I think, and our toilets had a gap at the bottom. And you know, it wasn't, you could understand why some people would say, I don't feel safe. Um, so I think if you are going to do it, think about design. And also, I think we maybe went a bit too hard with the messaging B of saying this is for everyone, and then it maybe be more discreet. You know, it's just just do it in a quiet way. But we made a big statement, and perhaps with online, it didn't help. It didn't help us. Yeah, well, that's the problem with inclusivity. You have to be you have to be there for the people that don't like it too. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're still not inclusive. So, um, 
I see there are headsets being passed around. Does that mean someone is going to do a presentation in Italian? Okay. Does everyone have a headset who doesn't speak Italian? Because then put up your hand and you'll get one. I definitely need one. Thank you. Um, so that means we're going to group number four. Io ho la valletta. ...aperta ad ospitare bimbi in difficoltà. Quindi noi li svegliamo. Li teniamo svegli fino alle 11, fino a mezzanotte. Il mio problema di base è che non ho spazi dove creare un bar, dove creare comunque un luogo di incontro, dove socializzare. Quindi cercavo una soluzione. Parlando con i ragazzi del gruppo è venuta fuori una soluzione molto, molto semplice. Non c'ero arrivata. Io all'interno della parrocchia ho un colonnato eh, aperto perché c'è un cortile in muratura, un colonnato che ripara e, e poi c'è la parrocchia. Quindi l'idea era di sfruttare quell'angolino di cortile comune con dei tavolini e, e includerci come bar, non, non il mio che dà solo caffè, popcorn e coca cola, ma il barretto che sta riaprendo sotto nel campetto sotterraneo che presto riaprirà a giorni, quindi includere il barretto, includere il cortile e creare spazi comuni tra il bar, la parrocchia e il cinema dove insieme possiamo coltivare socialità. Quindi questa è stata una sfida e una, una soluzione, quindi è stato meraviglioso poter lavorare in gruppo con altre persone che mi hanno dato una soluzione. You don't need an architect. Non hai più bisogno di un architetto. Fatto. Oh, that's great. I love the bar next to the church. That's an interesting thing in itself. Fantastic. Yeah, it's fantastic. Great. Thank you. Um, do you want to go to the next group? I've, I think it's number four, but I'm not sure. Number five, five. I'm waiting for Eva. I'm going to begin waiting for her. Houston, we've got two problems, but two real problems. Uh, I work in a uh, little cinema, uh, Plaza Art House Cinema. Uh, maybe Nicola will, yes, will show you the, um, the picture. That's our courtyard. And we did know that uh, two weeks ago that all the tables and the chairs will be disappear and uh, return to the owner of the city, is the owner of the, um, the seats and the tables. And uh, we thought about it in, in my group. And um, we have a solution in two times. So we will create a crowdfunding uh, to buy new uh, seats and tables um, and to, to uh, include the process. Uh, we want to write the, the name of the people who participate um, maybe two solutions on chairs, or uh, you can you cannot see, but on the the left side there is big windows, and we can put the name 
in uh, you know this lettrage I don't know what to tell in English uh, so uh, all the people who, who come in the cinema can see the name of the people and uh, but it will take times to create the crowdfunding to buy the the chairs so in between we we had the idea to create a workshop uh, that could be called uh, take a seat or uh, take your seat and uh, we can create a workshop for a day or um, an evening to paint all the, the seats uh, in black or white because you see our cinema is in black and white. A little green, a little bit. Donate chairs. Yes, they donate chairs and they can also write the name on it met with a system of pochoir, I don't know. And we can also work with, uh, we have a school, uh, uh, an art school uh, in our city. They can, came, uh, they can come and uh, help people to, to make this and to create something graphic or I don't know. Uh, and we decided to, to make, uh, because we are in Belgium, it's raining, raining, raining. Uh, so uh, maybe we can uh, keep uh, all the chairs for one summer one summer with the, the, the chairs and after buy the, the new one. And we have, uh, that's our solution, the problem with the solution and we have an another problem without solution. Yes, so uh, we have thought about some solutions but um, I already told you all that our direction we uh, have our art house cinema and the uh, multiplex um, of our city because we don't have our own building so this is the front and this is inside group five it was a coincidence but it's really <laughs> nice uh, we're like room five and you see like our little um, banner but we are looking for ways to like make this area a little bit more cozy and a little bit more matchy with our art house program because now it's really gray and sad and you know we don't get inspirational there uh, after the movie you don't feel in uh, like staying there much longer <laughs> and discussing the movie and we also don't have any restaurants or cafes uh, nearby only like uh, all you can eat sushi in the building which is horrible <laughs> so um, with our team we already brainstormed like how can we make this corner a little bit more um, you know cozy and to invite people to talk about uh, the movie afterwards but it's hard because we're dependent on the owner of the building and it needs to be like if there's a fire people need to still able to cross so we're thinking about maybe making a cozy corner with like second hand furniture you know like tapestries like make it really cozy um, also we already have ownership of the projection so I can make my own DCPs and choose my own um, pre, how do you say it, pre-movie. Yeah. So we don't have the commercials from the multiplex. But so we're actually looking for more ways to make it better, you know, to use what we have and make it as cozy and as nice as possible. But we have a lot of challenges with it because we're dependent on them and they not always so um, cooperative to work with us. <laughs> so that was a problem that we haven't really solved. So if anyone has more ideas to like include something, I already heard about the boards with like the IDs. I like that one. Maybe we could like, I don't know, include it somewhere. Um, yeah, so that's a problem we're still thinking about how to solve in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thank you. This is always a good one to workshop, adding atmosphere. Tapestries, like on the floor, really good idea. I think you can get them secondhand, like these par Persian tapestries. Yeah. Then you immediately create a space by changing the floor. I mean, it would be a shame to liven this up because this is such a beautiful, like, stark <laughs> corridor. I mean, like... You one, one thing I thought of is, could you move to number one? Because you'd... Y you can't, no, because you'd have more of a, like, less yeah, other people. They won't give it to you. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So this one is still to be workshopped, like if you suddenly come with a brainwave. 
come and come and help solve it. And with the first one, I have to say I really love the thing about the donation. Yeah, so the coloring the floor, which would already distinguish you from the rest of the, and might still be safe, unless somebody trips over when they're running out. Um, filters on the lights to create, yeah, mood lighting, yeah. Yeah, great, good. Fairy lights, fairy lights. We're turning this into a bedroom, a student bedroom, <laughs> aren't we? <laughs> Put some posters up. No, and, and maybe sound as well. You know, you might be able to do something with sound. I don't know what, but we have 10 more minutes. Do we have more groups? Yeah, let's do it. Next group. I've given. I've. I've lost track. It, it, it's your turn. My turn. Okay. Hello, everyone. So, well, we had an opportunity to be in a group of pretty good cinemas with uh, big problem and small problem. So, um, actually, uh, we had the thing. I think three or four cinemas that uh, we are using uh, the space that isn't ours and we are also not able to redesign or anything and especially uh, when you are a mar marketing manager who wants to create a brand and then you cannot put a single sign or touch the ball it's pretty pretty hard and it hurts sometimes so uh, the thing that uh, we got in uh, mind was uh, the first thing was uh, the furniture on wheels so to make a small setup that we can easily like repair in 15 minutes before um, the start and everything like to create a small cozy atmosphere that can be later removed and um, make that um, space more useful and everything also the second idea we got uh, was the usage of digital screens so to create a better atmosphere where we can project many many things. Also we had amazing second best uh, cinema in Romania and um, I asked them so what's the reason why you aren't first and they said well we are not in the capital so that's the only reason but they're really really good. I asked what's your target audience. They are trying to attract also the uh, youth people but also they have uh, programs for elderly. Um, we tried also to create some more visible brand but how to do the same brand for elder, elderly pe people and for the youth so actually we create we make an idea to create two different designs one is um, brand with more um, stronger colors and everything uh, to attract young people and the second one is like I don't know it can be a newspaper style or something for elderly so people when they are, I don't know, looking at the web page, they can already see like what is for them. So we like diversify those th things to attract more people and to make everyone feel welcome and comfortable. And did you think about the space as well in terms of bringing those two different types of audiences, the older people and the younger people? Well, it was also like combining the style, especially it's an art cinema, so to combining the styles into one universal and also like to to move some furniture a bit to create it more cozy and also what we said the usage of the screens so they have screens at the top that uh, can be in bright colors for some fancy movies or in uh, nor more strict conservative colors for example for uh, the other So older people don't like bright colors. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> let's rush through one more. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, make it quick, and we can finish off in the in the booty nose. 
So we were a small group and discussed our cinemas and hadn't really any challenges uh, we could tackle here. So we decided to dream up our own cinema, our uh, ideal cinema. It's called uh, Cinema Sogno. Um, we start with the entrance. It has to be an uh, inviting, attracting uh, entrance, accessible for everyone, with a good sign so you know it's a cinema. Uh, room for posters and uh, trailers on screens. Then you enter the bar. It's a cozy place where you can play board games, lend books, read the newspaper, meet people of your neighborhood and uh, people with same interest who love film. It has to, good, uh, has to have good coffee, good drinks and snacks. Uh, and also has an outside terrace with a little garden uh, uh, kind of festival vibe mm. and also a place in the bar where bands could play and live music can be. Then we have the box office. Uh, it has to be seeable from the entrance but not too uh, 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 close to the bar. Uh, there has uh, to be a uh, space where people can stand in line. It has to be a nice area and we have to have a friendly cashier who knows about film and can inform people. That was one of the problems that <laughs> we had in uh, one of the cinemas. The screening rooms have to be uh, accessible to everyone. There has to be good air control so you can stream uh, in summer and winter. Good sound system and lights. And very important, the toilets have to be next to the screening rooms and they have to be Instagrammable, so <laughs> people <laughs> Instagrammable <laughs> with nice neon signs on the mirrors. And uh <laughs> and we want a workshop room in our cinema where we could do workshops with kids, discussions, gatherings, and so on. That's our dream cinema. Uh, Instagrammable toilets. That's uh, yeah, that's such a good idea. Yeah. Well, we're going to redo our toilet, so um, I'm stealing this idea immediately. That's uh, that's cool. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. Um, we've got one more group, but yeah. Okay. Group eight. Yeah. Two minutes. So don't breathe. Just like. So hello. So for this uh, task, we decided. Well, so we chose uh, my cinema because we have like different kind of problems. And for this uh, task, we decided to work uh, on the visibility of our cinema because um, it's situated like in a historical building, like actually in the underground of it. And uh, since it belongs to the city, we cannot really put any writing on it or uh, like the name of our cinema so for now we just have like a kind of a standing poster in f like uh, at the entrance which seems like uh, not to work uh, well very well it's not uh, either elegant so um, and also like the people from the neighborhood so like a lot of them that don't know that there is this cinema because it's li really uh, a hidden place. So my uh, clever colleagues proposed this idea of working with uh, light and uh, some kind of uh, like animation or uh, video mapping uh, that we could like project on the building or like on the pavement in front of the on in front of the entrance and uh, so we could use also like different kind of uh, colors and uh, you know for the for the name of the cinema and uh, it would depend like on the occasion like if for the festivals or something we could we could change that and uh, for some festivals we could do like more uh, interesting things like this video mapping and uh, advantages of this are that it's quite a cheap solution and it's not invasive so it doesn't have like any real impact on, on the building and the challenges would be like we would have to find a place where could we like put the projector or these lights and also we would have to find someone that could like do this for us well that's pretty much it 
that's great. I mean, it's so that's brilliant because you're not touching the architecture and actually finding somewhere to project onto is not that big a challenge. Hopefully there isn't a, a listed building. And I, the projection mapping is extraordinary. Like the pictures Steph showed of the, the cinema, the, the cafe bar at Watershed, completely transformed by projection mapping. And there's a lot of companies that work for in the music industry or different you know, design that if you offer it as a kind of collaboration, it's a way for them to establish their work. I'm sure you'll find someone. We can put you in touch with some people in the UK, but I'm sure you can find someone, someone local. Great. It's time for lunch. And we can't be late. Apparently, we have to get there, so we have to do a quick walk, because otherwise we cause havoc. <laughs>